Yeah, you know how that is. <laughs> okay, this is the telling our stories, uh, where we have a, uh, an individual each week telling uh, part of their story, their Christian walk, uh, some experience they might have had, and uh, we're utilizing people who had some connection with Mechanic Grove either in the past or are presently involved in the life of our church here. Last week, uh, Christina Booker was here and she told part of her story, of course, growing up here in Mechanic Grove, uh, uh, long roots, uh, deep roots, I mean, and uh, ways in which she was nurtured by this congregation and has become one of the leading biblical scholars really in the country. Uh, and so, you know, just to think that this church helped nurture her and it got her started along that journey. Now we have a whole group of children that we're talking about getting into the scriptures and who knows where some of them will end up as well. But anyway, uh, today we're doing one of our local people. And of course, I don't need to introduce her to you I because know you know Seal Wanger. But I don't know how much of her story you know. And I think one of the things that she wants to talk about a little bit is her experience in, in Haiti. And uh, that's going to be part of it, I guess. But uh, the, whatever she's going to tell you, I know it'll be interesting. Next week, uh, Lori uh, Bench, Lori uh, Root Bench is going to be our speaker. Uh, Lori grew up in our church. Uh, she uh, married uh, Tim Bench, who is a, an opera singer and a pastor and a theologian. And uh, Lori, I understand, is a head of the Eastern Mennonite Mission Board and travels all over the world. So her story is going to be very interesting with experiences that she's had. Uh, so that's next week. So, Seal, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm going over to teach the class on Revelation. So I'm heading over there. Double duty today. All right. Well, it's nice. By the way, if you're looking for something to do this afternoon, 3 o'clock, I'm leading him sing at the Wenger Meeting House just north of Fredericksburg. So that'll be a, an interesting experience. And then tonight, I'll be leading worship and singing at Mount Gretna Tabernacle at the camp meeting. So got a big day today. All right. Is See that you. all? Oh, yeah, tomorrow morning on Thursday. I plan to be there for that. Well, after last week, I was pretty discouraged because this is geared for not necessarily this age group. I look at you and you have, many of you served with BDM and I was gearing this to hopefully encourage some of the young people, younger people to go. You don't lose an arm and a leg. You don't have to give your firstborn or anything. And so this was to kind of help you figure out what exactly happens on a BDM project. So my instructions were to tell how Mechanic Grove shaped me. Well, first of all, you've got to go back at least 65 years and realize that this community didn't look the way it does now, nor does this church the same as it was then. In those days, it was church. You went Sunday morning, you went to Sunday school and church, you went Sunday night, oftentimes you went Wednesdays. If you guys moved over there, you'd have made it even easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> I said they were so all over the place and it's like I'm talking to a big empty room. What? Thanks, Earl. Anyhow, in May, there was two weeks of evangelistic meetings. Now I've got to move. <laughs> all right. There's a lot of moving going on here. There were two weeks of evangelistic meetings and during that time, the ball team's games were canceled or to re be rescheduled. There were two weeks of Bible school in June, every morning for the weeks, and Friday evening there was a program. So church was very important to people, and it was their center for worship, it was their center for uh, service, and also a lot of the social part of their life revolved around church. As junior highs, so yeah, some of you would know, uh, we had two encouragers, Caleb and Martha Booker. For you who do not know, they were not married, they are brother and sister, but they were encouraging to us through our junior high and youth years and many of us through adult years. Some of the things that I remember doing for the junior high was um, bandage rolling. And for this, the um, women, the mothers oftentimes met and they would take sheets and rip them into about three inch pieces 
of the length of a sheet. And we had this little gizmo that you clipped onto a table, like uh, those old time meat grinders, you know, have the, f the feet on the top and the little screw thing that you tighten up and it holds it on. So there was a little crank on this and a roller, and we would start the fabric and just turn the crank till we had the whole length rolled up. These were bandages that were sent to the mission fields in Africa for their medical use. And I'm wondering, oh my. <laughs> Some of the sheets seem pretty thin. Maybe they were used a long time. How much is this going to soak up? But this was one of the projects that I remember doing. We also did um, things that I don't recall for people in the church and people in the community. As we got a little bit older, the youth had a pumpkin project at Bob Wagner's and Bob and Charlie Wagner's home farm. I don't know what we did with the pumpkins, but what the money went for, but that was one thing I remembered. Our activities socially revolved pretty much around the uh, seasons. In the summertime, there was always uh, swimming parties, doggy roasts, those kinds of things that you can find yourself involved with. Fall, we moved on to the hay rides and the costume parties, and then came winter, and that was a really big time. Because, believe it or not, there must be climate change. Because it seemed like every Friday night, Saturday night and Sunday afternoon, we were on Jim Crider's pond, skating, playing hockey, and having lots of fun. We also did sledding on uh, the hill at Conow where Conowinga School was. We had little lanterns we made with toilet paper and stuff in cans to light. And we, we were on the road sledding, and we didn't have any problems with cars. But I don't believe you do that kind of sledding anymore. Um, as we got a little bit older, we had the opportunity to go to New Windsor and pack clothes, and these were sent for relief. And it was a little bit irritating to me to see that people would give clothes that they cut the buttons off to send to somebody that needed clothes. Or you had things that had elastic in, and you're supposed to take care of these things, and you go like this, and there's no stretch. It already had done its stretching. I'm thinking, really, people? Uh, these people ha need, and this is what you're giving them? And <laughs> There was a project here at church with, with the home builders class that uh, they planted about an acre of strawberries on the farm where Scott and uh, Earl Mall grew up for the building fund, which I talked about earlier. I didn't mention the strawberry thing, but that took a lot of work. They didn't have any contracts with anybody, stores or anything. They peddled, they did anything they could to sell these strawberries. And, some of us had to help them, uh, or we were at home because they were gone and we were trying to pick up pieces at home. So there were lots of opportunities for service here. And I want to dovetail that into how Mechanic Grove shaped me. The other part of it was family, and as you can see, I'm kind of well-rounded. But we had four brothers. My father had, there were four of them that each had a farm. They started at Drewmore Center, and the farms were acreage came to uh, 72, as it was known at that time, which bisected the lands. And about a mile up the road, there were two more with farms. Well, we worked together, we shared equipment, and so there were lots of cousins, aunts, and uncles that were involved with your growing up. And when you came to church, here were these same people. So, I mean, you couldn't get away from it. The values seemed to be the same. It's like we were joined at the hip. The DNA was pretty much the same. Only when you got to church, there were parental first cousins and their families and all that. So it, it seemed like at that time, there was a lot of simple pleasure with everything. And there were so many opportunities to help with things that now you might not consider service. But I was thinking of some of the things that happened on the, the uh, house side of it. There were some times when you had too many lima beans and you needed help to shell, or peas, or a truckload of corn that needed to be processed, too many baskets of peaches for one, and you just got together and you took care of the job. So acts of service can be many different things. They don't have to be grandiose, such as drop off some food for someone who's sick or had a baby, maybe you visit, a note, a card, whatever it was. On the uh, farm side, we were very much a farming community. We think we are now, but when you think about it then and all the houses that are here now that weren't here then, it's changed a lot. The majority of people were farmers and the few businesses that there were in the community were very much oriented to support of the farm with the breakdowns and supply of feed, fertilizer, whatever. So in terms of helping there on that part of it, 
I remember one time there were people that would get together to haul manure. Maybe there was a problem with uh, one reason or another and a bunch of guys got together and they cleaned out a barn. They might have plowed uh, fields and prepared ground to plant corn. My father had a pretty serious um, hand accident one time right before first cutting hay and the men showed up, they cut all the hay in a day or two, it was raked, baled in the mow, and we had a great big ice cream party. These were acts of service, and if you look in Matthew 25, I don't have to read it, you know that. Um, he talks about separating the sheep and the goats, he being Jesus, and he says he was hungry, naked, sick, in prison, and I sort of interpret that to mean his way of explaining that we should be serving our fellow men. And I think that the actions that we were doing were service in a different way. I don't know nobody was running around naked or anything like that, but you were helping them for the need that was very much present. So if I were, I got a letter from a lady in this congregation not so long ago, and in it she used the term good old days, and that's pretty much a glib term, I think as you use it, but when I started thinking about this, I thought, you know, we had a lot of simple pleasures. We didn't have uh, tickets to a show in New York, you didn't go here, you didn't go, I mean, a trip to town was a major excursion, and only if it rained. You worked together. Your family and your church was kind of one big opportunity here for friends to be close. And when I think of the now, Oh my goodness, what are we dealing with? Technology. There's been an explosion of technology, and it can be really good, but there's a dark side of it. And I don't know why it's called the dark web, and uh, trust me, I won't find out why it's called the dark web. <laughs> He'll tell you that, I don't even know how to do it. But we're dealing with a pandemic. We're dealing with political division. We're dealing with opioid crisis, unprovoked war, racial tensions, a lot of fear and anger. So maybe in some senses they were the good old days, but we learned, we did things for people and with people without any second thought. Oh gee, let me check my calendar. Oh, I might be able to give you an hour this day. You just did it, it just happened, with and for people. And I wanna say that these were not necessarily grandiose things. It got to the point where we got a little bit older and then your vision started, um, you could see a little bit further. So my first trip was to Kentucky Mountain Housing when I did something that I wasn't sleeping at home. And I don't know, I talked to Alan about this and he doesn't remember how it got started, but Kentucky Mountain Housing was pretty important for quite a few years, a lot of people went and helped and probably a lot of you. This is why I say I'm disappointed because many of you have done these things. I'm trying, was hoping that some people would hear some of this uh, information and I told Earl I'm afraid it's gonna be a, a bore and a snore so he guarantees me he's gonna wave his hands. But for you people, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyhow, Fred Bernhardt told me, I, I went as a cook for two years. His parents had done it for a couple of years and I think Irvin and Grace DeLong had done it for a couple of years. I don't know how many we went. But Fred says, you feed them good, don't you give them hot dogs. Oh boy. So <laughs> I had the job. Oh, I don't know, were you there? Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know who. Okay, well he survived, this is good. I had the job of planning, purchasing, and preparing food for 20 people for three meals a day for a week. I didn't have any helpers. I don't know why, but anyhow, that's the way it was. And I managed to come back alive. I went to the store the last night. We had taken most of our food with us. I needed something for the last supper. So I'm in front of the meat counter, and here's this big tray of um, chicken legs. And over here is a big tray of pig ears. A lot of them still had the ear tags in the ear. So I'm back and forth. Chicken legs, pig ears. Chicken legs, pig ears. And the Lancastrian juices kicked in there and we went with the chicken legs. They were cheaper. The crew was pretty happy I chose the chicken legs. But after I was thinking about this, what in the world were they doing with those pig ears? Did they have some way of cooking them and we're mi missing out on a delicacy or did they feed them to their dogs? I didn't have those thoughts when I was down there. It was just get this taken care of. But I wondered about it and thinking about this, 
brought me to the conclusion that, you know what, once you get away from here, not every place looks like Lancaster County. Not everybody has a Solanco Fair. They might have boat races or whatever they are. So when you're going out on a project, you're most likely going to encounter people that may or may not have the same color of skin. They don't look the way you do. They don't talk the way you do. They don't look the w their houses or you think they're kind of shabby. Oh, by the way, why don't you call somebody and bring out, get somebody to drag off these uh, dozen or so vehicles that aren't going to run anymore. And oh, there's a few weeds over here. You know, our places are usually pretty manicured and a lot of places aren't like that. We cannot go in there and be judgmental. We go in there with the idea that these are all children of God and we are going to walk alongside them, not try to say, hey, you need to do this this way because this is how we do it. Well, I, one interesting thing I observed as being the cook, uh, first morning, man, were they gung-ho to go? And we're going to just get this taken care of. We're going to build this house or we're going to do whatever. The second morning, we were not quite so gung-ho. And the longer it went, the less energy we seemed to have. We got kind of tired. You know why? It was pretty hot down there, and we weren't really used to that heat. And we thought maybe they were a tad lazy because they just didn't seem to have that Lancaster County get up and go. But they knew how, what they had to live in. So that was my first experience with an away project, so to speak. This was my first encounter with um, BDM, which is Brethren Disaster Ministries, and I'll probably refer to it as BDM. But for days, there were ominous weather reports about this huge storm that was forming, and they weren't sure where it was going to go, and all this, you know, what happens with the weathermen and, and storms, etc. But the thing that bugged me most about that was people around here were all worried, what's going to happen to the fair? Well, I like the fair just as much as everybody else. But when you think about what the people in the bullseye of these storms are facing with the destruction, the death, the businesses, whatever, is just gone, I think the fair kind of pales in comparison. But it just pointed out, maybe we need to look a little bit beyond our own selves and our own little box to see what other people are facing. So anyhow, um, I think they were legitimate concerns here about loss of life, but I volunteered to go. I was told, we're not taking any women. And I thought, well, I can pick up sticks and limbs just as well as the next guy, but they weren't taking any women. About six months later, I got to go, and Charlie Wagner from this church and I went down. Let me tell you, Charlie knows every azalea between here and Char Charleston, South Carolina. If you've seen his backyard before they moved, it was just beautiful. But Hugo was a category five that hit Charleston. And as we got closer, it looked like a uh, forest of toothpicks, so to speak. Because there was a certain kind of tree, and I don't know what it was, that had been defoliated. So you just have this trunk standing straight up. The limbs, a lot, the leaves are all gone. And there's some that the limbs are gone and are a little prickly standing out, but it was kind of an eerie sight. And even after six months, a lot of people hadn't really done anything to clean up. Now you wonder, how does BDM choose their, who they, what project they take on? BDM works with local agencies, and usually the people that they work for um, might be low income, maybe they didn't have any insurance, Maybe they have physical limitations. Definitely they're below, well, that's low income. They ha or they might have been scammed. And that, was, that is very unfortunate. Let's meet Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth was the lady that Ray and I worked for. Ray was the um, driver for us going down there. And he was an older gentleman who uh, I think had been a carpenter. At least he knew his way around. Well, we were to work for Elizabeth. Before the storm, she had a nice home. After the storm, her home was a pile of rubble where her house had stood. She's going through the rubble, rubble, and here she finds a little memento that she had hanging on her front door that said, Jesus never fails. She was so overwhelmed, she just cried and cried and cried just for the joy of finding something, salvaging something. She was a very classy-looking black lady. I don't know how old she was. I'm guessing maybe 60s, 60s. But um, 
when we met her, she was living in one of those early, I think they were camping trailers. They started out in the back and kind of came up in a, in a curve, like a comma thing, a little gray thing, sitting in her yard. It was surrounded with huge pools of open sewage, raw sewage, all over the place. She was living in this trailer provided by uh, Samaritan Purse, which is Franklin Graham's charity organization. And she also cared for, but I don't know if this girl actually lived with her, a girl who was in a wheelchair. And I, I don't know how, I'm guessing she was in her early teens, like 12 to 14. She couldn't walk. She sat in this wheelchair, and I remember her one hand was kind of curved like this, and the other one was like this. She just was really in poor physical shape. She was blind. And I don't think she ever talked. But Elizabeth cared for this woman. Well, BDM had built her a home. But we could see it. We looked in the door, and you could see that it was furnished. It was ready for her. But they wouldn't allow her to move in because she didn't have an occupancy permit. And the reason she didn't have that was because they had raised the floodplain level to 16 feet. So Elizabeth would have had too hard a job to push a wheelchair up a slant that steep. So Ray and I were to build a, ha a ramp around three sides of this house. Okay, I do know the difference between a, a hammer and a saw, and I'm not afraid to be on a ladder. So we were good to go. Well, we were making pretty good progress, and uh, one morning Ray got really upset. Oh no, oh no. I said, so I, good grief, Ray. If you just cut a quarter inch wrong one way or the other, cut another board and let's keep on going. I said, what's the matter, Ray? He said, my hearing aid. My hearing aid. And I, oh my goodness, I looked down from the ladder and here we both had our ladders. There was one of these sewage things. I, oh no, I don't want to go fishing today. <laughs> well, we got down off the ladder and we stood there just kind of hemming and hawing. We knew what we had to do and I knew what I had to do because I didn't think he could bend over. So anyhow, I, I know I didn't ask him. It just was an impulse. I went up to him, and I started patting him down. He had on a red flannel shirt. I got to the pocket, and there was a bump in the pocket. I said, Ray, what do you have in your pocket? He reached in his pocket, and here was his hearing aid. I'll tell you, we were so overjoyed. You have never seen a bigger, longer-lasting bear hug, and I'm not sure which one of us was more happy that he had his hearing aid or I didn't have to go fishing. But oh boy, that was a joy to find that thing in his pocket. We managed to get the ramp done, and they weren't happy with it. But we did what they told us. They wanted another board from, if this is the top and this is the ramp, in the middle. Because of children being around there, and I thought, you dummies, you don't know much about children. All it would take is stick one leg over that board and follow with a trailing leg, and they were going to be 16 feet down. But we did what they said. It was done, and they were satisfied. We had got to come home. About a week after I was home, I got a letter from um, our project director, and he said that Elizabeth was in her house and that um, everything was going well for her. And about two weeks after that, I got a package in the mail, and I had no idea who this was from. And I opened it up, and here was this basket. Elizabeth scoured the area where she lived for um, reeds and grasses, and she wove this thing, and she sent this to me as a thank you gift, and I'm thinking, lady, you need the money that you would get from selling this far more than I need this basket, but she was just so thankful and overjoyed that she had her beautiful home, and we got rid of the trailer, and the sewage was taken care of. The next one that I worked on, and these aren't necessarily in order, but many of you have been to Chalmette. You've heard of Katrina with all the flooding, loss of life, and so on. New Orleans, is New Orleans as they say, is below flood um, sea level, so it floods very easily. There, there were, what, 36 inches of rain, I think, and the levees broke, and everything was flooded, and it was just a big loss of uh, life with over, I think it was something like 3,400 people were killed in this. And of course, the businesses, everything was gone. Well, when we went on this one, um, there was a bunch of you here, and I'm not sure which one some of you were on, but anyhow, you know if you were there. Um, they had trailers. We stayed at a church, and there were tra the trailer part, not the tra of a tractor trailer, they had steps up to that, and there were beds around the side for the men, 
and the women stayed in travel trailers, which they had for families, and I think they should have had a lawyer, on a divorce lawyer in every court, on the corner, because they were so small. Ours was for four. There was, the stove was this big. There was no room to store anything. You were just on top of each other all the time. And families lived in these things for months and months and months. Ours was parked on the parking lot of the church, and there was a shower trailer there. So we had everything we needed. We were fine. We were only gonna be there a week. And we ate at the church. They had um, a kitchen, the church kitchen. They had rooms set up with tables in for uh, dining, and there was an area where they had the things to put out for us to pack our lunches. So for you who do not know, you get breakfast, and supper is cooked for you. There are things there that you pack for your lunch to take to the job site. There are devotions, morning and evening, volu people volunteer for that, and the leaders will give um, instructions on what they want you to do, and there's a back and forth with comments and what went right and what do you need and all this kind of thing. And usually, um, there's a trip to another uh, special place in the area. This time it was in, they went into, BDM took people into New Orleans that wanted to go see the sights of the city. On that particular job, we worked for Ron. Ron was a victim of scammers. He had gotten his insurance check and gave it to a contractor who was supposed to fix his house. Well, the check was cashed and his house wasn't fixed. And they were so pleased that the group before us was a group of girls from a college in California. Oh, they were drywalling and they were going on. Well, their leader happened to be some young pup who uh, knew about drywalling from a book. And everything that they did was wrong. Our job was to tear out all they had done and start over. So we really didn't get a whole lot done for him. But that was an experience too. The second time we went to Talmet was quite different. This time uh, we stayed in a home that was owned by a congressman and he left the brethren, used this for three years in return for us fixing his house. Bob Hirschberger did a wonderful job refinishing those stairs. They were so pretty, you almost didn't want to walk on them. I believe Doris Amit was a cook at this house. They cooked in the house, yep. And the big highlight here was um, Taco Tuesday. And this was started, I think, probably by John and Mary. I don't know their last name, but they were the, the big honchos at this place. And they invited all the uh, people from the NGOs and AmeriCorps and all that that wanted to come to the Brethren House on Tuesdays for tacos. This was a big deal. There was usually over 100 people there for tacos. There was music, lights, just a time for them to kick back and relax. And they looked forward to that. At that particular house, uh, yeah, that one, was, we worked for a guy whose name was Sal. Barry Axe cut all the drywall that we got up that week, that we got up that week. Lauren's here, yeah, Lauren was on that one. He was uh, on the drywall, what were we doing? Sanding and looking dirty, and it, all you could see from him was his rear end was white. I don't think he did anything. He was just sitting on a bucket. <laughs> but <laughs> he could do the lower ones with that. He was, bu he was busy, I'm just teasing you a little bit, Lauren. And on that one, again, they took trips into uh, New Orleans. Tennessee was a flooding one. Some of you were on that one. That was kind of a pre-drywall, which I, I don't really like drywall. I'm not good at it at all, but anyhow. On that one, you were putting up rafters. This was close to a river, and I know a couple of people were commenting about the, watching this deer swim across the river. <laughs> it was rather interesting. I was part of um, a group that was putting uh, insulation between the studs. And on this one, Margaret Axe was one of the cooks, and we, she usually welcomed us back to, at the end of the day, with uh, freshly baked cookies. She took good care of us. They smelled awfully good. And this uh, venue, the opportunity existed for people to go into uh, the Grand Ole Opry. Some went and some didn't. Many of you were at the uh, Superstorm Sandy in New Jersey here, a big storm just kind of camped over Jersey and dumped a whole bunch of rain on the area. And for this one, um, we went, there was a group of us, we drove, and um, they broke the groups up into uh, three or four people per group. Carol, you were a cook on that one, weren't you? Yeah, just seeing you made me think of that. She was at Nashville? Okay. Uh, after... 
Yeah, and we, we were bunkies, and she, she's a good soul. I like her a lot. Um, what were we doing? Our group had a middle-aged guy who knew a lot about carpentering. I don't know if he was actually a carpenter, but he actually knew how to do things, and Glenn was in it, myself, and another young lad who uh, should not have been in our group. He was not to be on a roof. He just couldn't handle that. But anyhow, it seemed like he wanted to be up there in a bad way. He was very curious and very bored. So I was trying to keep an eye out, and one time I looked out, and here he was at the top of the ladder, and you could see his eyes just looking up over there. Oh, you need to go down. It took a long time to get him down, but we finally got him down. But later on, he did get up on there. He up the ladder, up the peak, down the peak, and he's bending over, the, looking over the side. I, oh, my goodness. He had no concept of safety or his, <laughs> it was very scary, and it was hard to get him down off of that one. But our job at that place was to um, put a new roof on this lady's house, and she had been scammed also. So this didn't, we were supposed to have this done in a week. So you had two and a, and a half and, and a part of people to do this. One and the other guy, I can't remember his name. I was a half, and the other guy was probably a quarter. <laughs> But anyhow, we were really pushing because the weather report wasn't favorable to get this done. And once we got started, I uh, quickly realized that this wasn't going to be such a quick job because they had put a second roof on top of the original roof that was bad. So it took a long time to get it off. And once we got it off, we found out that quite a bit of the, uh, I think it's plywood that's under there, needed to be replaced, like huge chunks of this had to be replaced, and that really cut down. Yeah. What? On that trip, the head of the whole BDM for the Church of the Brethren came and visited that site, and I remember him up on the roof giving me instructions on how to put roofing on. Okay. I forget his name, but he was, uh, no, Mucho Grande. I see. So maybe I wasn't the half on the group. <laughs> Anyhow, Carol. Good. We have capable people in leadership. What a Earl probably knows his name. I got to keep going. Or I'm not going to get to Haiti. Um, <laughs> We were really pushing, and we did manage because Earl and I think at least one other guy, maybe two, came and helped. So by Friday, the blue tarps were gone, and her roof was on, and it was cleaned up, and everybody was happy. It did not rain. Now, let's go to Haiti. Oh, boy. A 7.0 earthquake hit in January of 2010 hit Port-au-Prince. This is the capital of Haiti. If you know anything about Haiti, it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. The least, well, no one needs that kind of destruction, but they just weren't in any shape to handle it. You had thousands of people that were killed. You had all kinds of destruction, and with the infrastructure affected, lots of cholera and disease broke out. So they were hurting in a, in a big way, many different ways. This was the first time I'd ever been outside the United States, and I really didn't know what to expect from, from a trip. We got a conference call. We had a conference call. Uh, by the way, Earl went on this trip, and also Mel Schaub. And a quick, quick comment about Mel. Mel went with two big suitcases, and they were full. And they came back full. They were filled with things that he had bought to give different places to give out to people at Willow Valley. So he was buying all kinds of things to help the uh, people that were, were selling, which I thought was probably a very good gesture. We're trying not to buy, and here he was out of the goodness of his heart. But anyhow, I've, one thing I forgot to tell you here. Um, shoot, where is it? I can't find it. Moving on. We had this conference call. And the first thing I learned was that in Haiti, women do not wear pants, shorts, or tank tops. And it's quite warm. So when you're going out of the country, like I said before, areas are different. There are different cultures and norms that you really do need to fit into. 
So I was told I was going to be on a sewing project, and I thought, well, I hope I can handle that, but i got to get some skirts. So I'm in the process of accumulating a few skirts to wear, and then I get a phone call, no, you're going to be on construction. You need pants. You can wear pants on the site. Okay, fine, we'll get some pants. So we finally got going to Haiti, and Sunday night we went to a church in Miami, the Church of the Brethren. They, oh, my goodness. We got there late. I don't know when it started, but it was packed. It was dark. And the people in it were Haitian Church of the Brethren. So they were all black. And what you could see, well, they paraded us around through the back somehow, and we ended up up there sitting behind a pastor who was speaking. And here are all these nine white, lily white people, and all you saw when you looked back there were white teeth. They were very happy to see us, but we didn't feel very good sitting up there where we were. We got down to Haiti then in the morning. We left early in the morning and got there, and one of the first things that they did was to take us around to this, uh, quote, housing area. And this looked like, to me, uh, four poles or posts in the ground and tarp stretched around it, right, and on the roof. But instead of having tarp on it, it was now blue ribbons blowing in the breezes because the wind had kind of shredded the tarp and there was absolutely no protection from rain, sun, wind, or anything. But this was their house. Uh, this was, by the way, called the land of milk and honey. I'm thinking, I don't know where the milk is or the honey. It didn't look too, too wonderful. But the interesting thing here is one lady wanted me to see her garden. So I went in front of her house, she had these tires that were probably, what, truck tire? Not the big trucks, like maybe a pickup truck tire. And I looked in it, and the only thing I recognized was a tomato plant. I recognized them. The other things were growing. I didn't know what they were. But I looked in, and they weren't too big. All I saw were little pieces of stone. There wasn't dirt in there. And I thought, how is this thing going to grow? I don't know, but she was very pleased with her garden. And I, for her sake, I was hoping she got a lot of food out of it. Where did we stay? Where's Ed? Are you going to put that one up? You were hopping around back there. <laughs> He's going to put it up. We stayed at a, um, it was called a villa. This was for foreign journalists and government people and visitors such as us. Yep, that's the front of it. You can see the wall is pretty high. It was considered to be a secure area. The wall is pretty high and it was gated. Can you move those other ones from there? Oh, you're good. Okay. Um, it was very pretty. We went in March, and so we're just pulling out of winter on the gray and the drab of winter, and you go to this one. Got it? Oh, we switched them around. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. Well, there was green. There was a lot of flowers in there. They were blooming everywhere. And it was just kind of eye candy after a long winter for us, anyhow. This place was considered secure and safe for us because of the food and the water. I don't know if he was called a cook or a chef, but the, anyhow, they had preparing, they were able to prepare food that we were for foreigners. That was us. There was a pool there. It was around that area. And honestly, it didn't look like anybody wanted to swim in it, and no one in our group did swim in it. Ralph, wake up. It was just kind of horrible looking. Earl said he was going to do it. I told you this is going to be snore and bore and snore. See, I got that right. Anyhow, the temperatures ranged from 105 to about 115, so it would have been enticing to go swimming, but... None of us ever did. We were warned, do not drink the water. Do not brush your teeth with the water. Do not put any water on your face or your head. Well, it was kind of interesting. When I took a small flashlight, and it was with fear and trepidation I took the thing because my father had given it to me, and I didn't want to lose it in the airport, and thankfully I didn't. It was in the check thing, so that's probably why it made it through. But there wasn't always electricity. So it was rather dark in the morning when you're trying to find your things. We each had, well, I guess you guys were doubles, right? There were no women, so I was by myself. Okay. In mine, there was uh, two twin beds along the side. There was a bathroom in the back and a small wooden table and a small chair. And as far as I can recall, that was any, all that was in the room. You guys probably had the same thing. 
But anyhow, finding your clothes in the dark is a little hard because most times there wasn't electricity. We were always hoping that when we got back at the end of the day, the electricity would be on so we could take a shower because it was brutally hot for us. And it might be on, if you, it was on, you possibly would be able to take a shower, but it would definitely be uh, cold water. The cook prepared breakfast and supper for us, and I don't really remember what we had for breakfast other than um, the juices he made. They used uh, fresh tropical fruits of different kinds. That he didn't often tell us what they were, but the one I especially liked was a tropical grapefruit. I'd never heard of that before, but I was surely hoping he would serve it again, and he didn't. But every morning there was this good fresh now they served us pork, maybe not in the form that we would recognize. Chicken, Earl kind of stayed aware, steered away from that. We had goat, we had conch, and I don't know what else we had other than those plantains. Maybe you remember some of the foods. It didn't, it didn't register that it was really disagreeable. I mean, it, it was edible. It was just different than what we were used to. Okay, and I said, what to expect? Well, we were ex finding out a lot of things that were very different than Lancaster County, and one of those was the language part of it. It was a mixture of French and Creole, and I couldn't remember much of my French from high school. And of course, we didn't know their language, they didn't know ours. We were fortunate enough to have a Pastor Romy with us. He was a pastor from the other side of the island, and he was our translator. He was very good, very interesting. What did we actually do? Well, the truth of it is precious little. <laughs> Our job was to go to this complex that the Church of the Brethren in Haiti had started to build. They wanted to have a place where people that came to work could stay, it would have rooms, bathrooms, kitchen facilities, uh, dining rooms, large and small conference rooms would all be in one, one area. The construction was quite primitive. Earl was mixing mud. He had a five-gallon bucket with a rope tied on it that he dropped down a hole. I don't know if there was a well or what was down there, but hand over hand he pulled it up and we had water and he was mixing mud. And that was it. There wasn't any big cement mixer rolling in. In terms of tools on there, uh, I did not, there was a, not a single metal ladder on the property. I I think I remember seeing what I called a Jesus ladder. He told me one day I should find a ladder, and the only thing I could find was one that uh, looked like it had been made from uh, limbs that were about as big as my forearm for the vertical pieces, and then just smaller pieces uh, nailed across for the, the rungs up the ladder. That was it. There were precious few tools of any kind on the, the, on the property. Very, very limited. So, you know, progress was pretty slow. I don't know how long they'd been working on it. They probably still are, <laughs> I don't know. But you really had to pace yourself. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say it was well over 100 degrees. It was quite hot and we weren't used to that. But they seemed to be able to manage moving rather slowly, but moving anyhow. Some of the interesting things here, first of all, let's talk about the infrastructure. <laughs> Someone wanted to know if we drove in Haiti. No, we did not drive in Haiti. You remember how we bumped down Prince Street for months and months with all that uh, construction going on with the gas and whatever they were doing there? Well, let me tell you, that road made the Haitian roads look, uh, the Haitian roads made Prince Street look like a super highway, deluxe even. There were potholes that I think could swallow some of the little cars, just huge. And they weren't just a little mm -mm, and you're out. They were deep, very, very deep. So the, adding to that was uh, there were precious few traffic lights like red and green. Okay, it's your turn to go. Okay, now you go. There were not stop signs and there were not street signs. So people just kind of were ramming every which way. And it's like, ooh, this is kind of scary. The best thing you could have was a good horn. <laughs> They got used frequently. And it occurred to me, looking around there, there was enough rubble around that place. If they'd have brought in a cement crusher or something like that, they could have uh, patched those roads and had something that might have been a little less bumpy. How did they get around? Well, the cars that we saw were old, 
old, old U.S. cars. I don't know what year they might have been, but very old. Do you have any idea in the year in that, Earl? 50 years ago. That long? Oh, my goodness. Well, I was thinking the trucks that we saw looked like uh, those big clunky things you see in the World War II movies. Well, I don't know. Well, that, oh, that is more than 50 years ago. Well, anyhow, they were old. We saw a few buses, and they didn't look quite so dated as the cars and the trucks. And one this lady got off the bus one day, and I saw her. She was carrying something in her hand. Here she had two chickens tied by the feet, and she was just carrying the chickens down the road. Doing it. They're flapping their wings, and off she went. So, you know, nothing to it. Scooters were big. They were just everywhere darting, and they were scooting. They really were. It was just crazy the way, the way they moved around through things. And that a common mode of transportation was walking. And we saw girls with the things on their head carrying stuff like you see from Africa. One day I saw a girl that was um, walking along, and she had a pig under her arm. It was about this big, just like she would have been carrying a dog. I don't know what was going to happen to the pig, but um, she didn't seem too upset about it, and it wasn't squirming or wiggling or squealing, so I guess everything was all right. The most interesting thing, I think, were the tap-taps. Tap-tap is what we would call a taxi, and it didn't look like our taxi. <laughs> they were small pickup trucks, not a regular size, but the downside, this little size. They had bench seats on the side, and then there were racks behind it and in front of the cab. Well, the seats got filled up, but the taxi wasn't full. They just kept piling in. They were standing in there. They were hanging off the sides. You name it, it was, they were piled in there. And I think this was a case where these uh, people worked together. They had a driver, and they had a guy on the back. And when you wanted to get off, you just tapped on the truck somewhere, and <laughs> he would stop, and the guy would collect the money. You hopped off, and off they went. But they were very colorful because voodoo is quite common in Haiti. And the decorations were wild. You don't have any pictures of them. Earl can't find his pictures, and I didn't bother. It seemed like I, I was too dumb to mess around with what I was supposed to do and work at camera. But anyhow, they were purples and yellows and greens, colors flashing at you and figures that you were trying to figure out what they were, but it, I don't think it was really worth trying to figure out what they were. Um, I don't think I told you this one. We went to church on Wednesday night, and it was like the Haitian church in uh, Miami. It was in a house, though. And I don't know if that was typical or, or what it was. What I remember was it was packed. They were very joyful. They were very energetic, and the singing was quite spiritual. We didn't understand a single word. Um, same joy was there. What I did see there was one lady that had some gray hair. That was the only person in Haiti that I saw that had gray hair. And I wondered, maybe they don't live long enough to get gray hair. Medical s situation. Steel, about that church service Wednesday night, mm -hmm. they cracked open the brand new, what do they call them, hand organs? The organ, the, the, uh, I can't think of the name now. Keyboard. Oh. They broke open the brand new keyboard, which was sent to us from Bob, from people here at the Catholic Church. Oh, I did. I forgot about that. Thank you, Earl. Yeah. <laughs> Medical issues. Well, we were riding along, and they showed us this is a hospital. And I looked at it, and it looked like a Motel 6 with about four rooms in the thing and, and only one story. And I wondered, um, really, how many people? There's no parking lot. Do you have a doctor in there? Do you have any machines or anything. We complain about doctor's appointments and all this, how much it costs and everything. And I looked at that and I'm thinking, I think I'll take our, our system of doing things. I did not see a single person in Haiti that wore glasses. I did not see anyone that was overweight. I think there was a lot of insecurity with food. Um, right before, the day before we left, Pastor Romy had received word that an eight-year-old boy in his congregation had died. He got a cut on his leg, and when he realized that it was he needed attention, they started to go somewhere. I don't know if they were walking or what, but just tragic that an eight-year-old boy has to lose his life because he got a cut on his leg. We are so blessed. 
What's this schooling like? I gotta get moving here, holy smokes, I was worried. Um, in Haiti, each school has its own uniform. It's very distinctive. They're all, every school has a different uniform. And one day, Alexan, who was our leader, and he could be uh, Mike Tomlin's twin brother, and his wife, Kayla, Alexan is Haitian. Um, Kayla, his wife, was a teacher from Miami. They were walking down the road or street or whatever, and this child just kind of came in and got between them like, okay, here's mom and dad, and walking with them. And she said, why isn't this child in school? Well, his parents can't afford it, or he would be, because he didn't have a uniform on. But to go to school in Haiti, you had to buy your own uniforms and your own books. So right then and there, they started talking about starting a school. And this came to fruition. She had been a teacher. They started the school, and not all of them were little first graders, because there were some like this that had never had any schooling. They gave them uniforms and books, and they gave them hot meals two days a week with the goal of eventually getting to every day. And for some of them, that was the only food they had other than what they would find in a dumpster. Um, it wasn't long till they realized that, you know, these children aren't gonna be in first grade every, all, all the time, and they're gonna have to move up. So they kept adding a grade. I was able to go to Lancaster COB a couple of years ago, and Alexan was speaking there. I talked to him, I said, how far along is your school? They were up to the eighth grade by that point, just adding a grade. They took us to their school. Now, that was something, too. I don't think they'd have to raise our taxes for that kind of school. It was cement block, very small. There was a window opening. I don't think there was any panes or anything in it, just an opening and a door. And it, the walls, every single wall was totally blank. There was nothing on the wall. In the middle was a table that le went the length of the, or width, whichever way they had it oriented, of the building, and on each side was a bench. That was school for them. It was very small. Um, I'm sure they sat pretty close. Showed us the playground, and it was all dirt and stone, no grass anywhere. Stores, well, I don't think they really had stores. I, sh I need to move on here. They didn't really have stores. They just kind of put things out on the ground and, and I guess scooped them up at night so no one took them. I guess the, the one place I remember the shoes. I remember piled on a table. But most of the stuff was just down on the ground. With Haiti, there's a lot of political instability. There's no stable government. There were frequent promises made with coups and all of that. And projects were started but never finished. We had dictators that came and went because they might have been shot or whatever. When we were there, the election was approaching and trouble was brewing. The UN was there to secure and oversee the election. And really, it was kind of scary. I saw trucks that were an awful lot bigger than I'd ever seen before, really high trucks that had UN on the side and a bunch of soldiers up in the way up high in the beds with bigger guns than I've ever seen and I don't really want to see. And there were a lot of other trucks, smaller, with soldiers patrolling the streets. At night, especially, you heard gunfire. Lots of hollering and yelling, and especially at night with the gunfire. So on Friday, they brought us back to the um, compound at lunchtime for our safety. And it was kind of unnerving. We couldn't find Mel. And here Mel's outside giving away some of the toys that he took. I think, Mel, 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 get in here. We, we did the stand out. Anyhow, um, with the, with the uh, election approaching, we had these mango trees. I can't remember if I told you this. We had these mango trees around our, our uh, cabins and so forth. And when they dropped their fruit, they were ripe. It was coming down on a tin roof, and it just sounded like gunshots all the time. And I'm thinking, well, we just started pretending that the real gunshots with this election problem was... Um, mangoes falling on the roof. Yesterday, I heard on the news a blip that got my attention. I thought this would be the perfect wrap up with this. So I'm gonna read part of this to you. But it starts out, if a doctor's prescription could bring you longer life, better health, more energy and resilience, less burnout, depression and anxiety, more happiness, fulfillment, and well-being, more personal and professional success, including higher income, and no harmful side effects, would you take this prescription? Well, you wonder what it is? 
These two guys were uh, a neuroscience, into neuroscience, and they each had practices, and they started um, focusing on a superpower that comes from a giving other focused person. They found out that kinder people not only live longer, they live better. And science showed them that serving others is not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do for yourself. We're into an age of self-care and me time and all of that. But what they found that getting outside your own head was one of the best things that you could do for yourself. The power of serving others, I'm skipping a lot of this because oosh, I was worried. Uh, reaches far beyond the medical world and can be life-changing therapy for everyone. And that's why I say, you people aren't who I was hoping to gear this toward. But, I mean, you're, you're there, you're doing it. You don't need a total life upheaval to achieve this. All you need is a purposeful mind shift. And this doesn't have to be a real um, dramatic thing. Just start small. The best way to be well, to well-being and finding your true fulfillment is this. Scan your orbit for the people around you in need of help. Go fill that need as often as you can. And I, I hope I can get the book and read it. So what are some of my takeaways here? Number one, we are all God's children. No matter what we look like, where we live, the color of our skin, our station in life, how much money we have, what we eat, or what language we speak. Number two, Service means caring and sharing as one walks alongside the least of these. Number three, discovered this. Disasters bring out helpers as well as a faction that will help themselves for their own benefit and gain at the expense of victims of natural disasters. We ran into some of those. Uh, and finally, encourage you, I encourage you to step outside your box Walk along with someone who needs the loving, caring hands and feet of Jesus. That's all I got. That's what Vince says when he's done. That's all I have. So if anybody has any questions, I bet Errol can answer them. Yes. As a reminder, yeah. Anybody else want to know anything that I don't know? Glenn. Yeah, use that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. He was there. Okay. But uh, Norma didn't go out on the job. She did the cooking. She was a cook? Okay. Yes. Um, well, Ken and Clint, they left early, and I came home with Carolyn and Clarence Wanger. Okay. Well, you made it home. That's good. Was that the trip you Clarence hauled tobacco down? You'll have to ask Clint. Clarence, was that the trip you hired to haul the backhoe down there? That's you, sir. You did one year, I know. The yeah. first, the first year that we went down, we took the backhoe and the a dump truck. And dump truck. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else want to know anything that we don't know? <laughs> you think you remember things, but after a while, it gets a little fuzzy, and it, is this, this really the way it was? Is this what I remember when... He said, can you talk a little bit about Haiti? I said, well, maybe I'll remember a little bit. And then he said, I'll get back to you. So he comes back, and I said, well, I guess I'll do it. How long is this supposed to be? And he said, 50 minutes. And I said, oh, my goodness, I don't know that much. To <laughs> That's why I threw in the other things. But my first trip, I didn't know what to expect. And so each one, you pick up a little few nuggets here and there of the hows and the whats. And you people have been there, done that. I was hoping it would be younger people that would be encouraged to go because it is real a blessing. I won't guarantee you all get a basket, but um, <laughs> <laughs> our goats stay precious. 
Yeah, they are. And I'm upset. My one little thing is kind of coming apart there. I don't know if I want to try to glue it or not, but yeah. it's Thank very, you. very fine reeds that she has in here. Yes, Lauren. No, I don't want to say that. No, two people in the mansion. They took five years of the night. They were, the woman was a pastor in Florida, and she, and he was construction, on a construction thing, and they sold the house and construction thing and took five years off the to be in New Orleans, to be in charge. Was that John and Mary? I think maybe that was John and Mary. Mill, no. Thank you. I couldn't remember the last name. You're right. I remember and, that and, now. And then to find her on to one of the things, and she was mostly PR for the group down there. Mm -hmm. And he took care of how everything at the White House to, and he checked the house out before we got there. One thing I didn't mention on service that meant an awful lot to me when we were talking in the beginning about things that you did locally for the church and so forth. One Christmas, our children were in preschool. All of them were sick. And for every single day, including Friday, or I'm sorry, Saturday and Sunday, I was at the doctor with at least one of them, sometimes more than one. And one night we heard this commotion, so to say, it just was different sounds. Looked out and here was a group that was Christmas caroling for us. It was a group from this church and I am 99% sure, maybe you were in the group, Ralph, I don't know, that we would not have been on the list but someone said, let's stop and sing for the Wangers. They, their children are sick. You were on your way to West Willa to uh, visit uh, Mrs. Charles, is my guess of what happened there. But you'll never know how much that simple little five or eight minute thing meant. And I encourage you, you know, you've done this. You write a note, you make a phone call or say a smile is just priceless to one of the least of these. You don't know what their troubles are. I mean, you can see they've got clothes on or whatever, you know, when he lists those things. But people need different things. And it is a, just a tremendous boost. And every time when I see Christmas caroling here at the church, I am drawn back to that. I can just hear that as plain and know how much that uplifted us at that particular time. That's all I have. You probably want to. Uh. Go and spread the word. Get some younger people to get interested and go. <laughs> Here. What? Say it. At the beginning of your talk, you talked about how ingrained the church work is for individuals. Yeah. And I remember Caleb Booker talking about, to show how he had been taught as a young person, he would lead worship services for the heifers in the heifer pen. Oh. And Martha Booker would be the song leader. Okay. So after school, Martha and Caleb would go down to the heifer pen and they would hold evangelistic services. Oh, so all the heifers were converted? Years and years later, Caleb realized, someone told him, that those heifers were hungry. Oh. And his feed was not what they were bawling for. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> was, I mean, you got to get down in a couple layers there, but yeah. that was our childhood.